Hello and welcome to the God's Words Bible Study and as usual we'll start with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God we thank you Lord for all that you do and we pray Lord that as we open your word that you will come near to us and that you will teach us and strengthen us and guide us as to how to live more victoriously in this world. In the holy name of Jesus Christ your Son our Savior we pray. Amen. Amen. And we are on the book of First John and we're doing an expositional Bible study, meaning that we are going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word by word. And the last time we met, we stopped at 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. So today, we'll pick up our reading from verse 18, 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, to the end of the chapter. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God, and whatsoever we ask we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us, by the Spirit which he hath given us. Amen, amen. And so as we start our study today in verse 18, let us just do a recap. Let us just go back to verse 16 and 17 just to put verse 18 into context so that we can better understand it and so verse 16 reads hereby perceive we the love of god because he laid down his life for us we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren but whosoever hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him how dwelleth the love of god in him and now verse 18 my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So you can see here that verse 18 is coming off of these two enormous verses that told us two things. And what are the two things that we just discovered in verse 16 and 17? The first one is that we are supposed to love others just as those Christ loved us in as far, folks, as he died for us. The second thing that he told us is that if we have stuff, if we have resources and we see our brethren, our brother have a need which we can fill and we don't, how is that loving our brother? You know, in fact, I think it is Jonathan Edwards who speaking of sacrificial love, this is what he says. If we be never obliged to relieve others' burden, but when we do it without burden ourselves, then how do we bear our neighbor's burdens when we bear no burden at all? He's saying that if the only time we bear our neighbor's burden is when it doesn't burden us. If it's the only time we help somebody, it's when it doesn't cost us anything. Right. And not, not just cost. I don't think he's just saying not just cost. But if it doesn't even put us under any pressure. Or it doesn't put you out. It doesn't inconvenience you. Right. He's saying that if that's the only time that you do anything to help your neighbor, then how are you bearing their burden if you're not bearing any burden whatsoever? Okay? And so here John says in verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. James chapter 4 verse 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So again, in context of what you're saying, if we see that somebody has a need, and we can fulfill it, and don't, we have sinned. Right. Here's what the Bible is saying. It's not just saying that if we see someone of a need, and we can fulfill it. It's saying even if we have to fulfill it, at the expense of our own comfort and our own well-being, 
we should do it. That's the emphasis. You know, David said, if you remember when, and this is such a beautiful story, when David sinned against God by numbering Israel, and God decided to forgive David and to forgive Israel, David was so thankful that he wanted to give a sacrifice to God. And he was on top of this mountain, and the mountain actually, the site where Solomon, David's son, would eventually build the temple. The person who owned it at the time offered David the threshing tools and the bullocks in order to offer to God. Mm. And David's respond to him. And it's funny because it says of this incident that this guy offered these things to the king as a king. In other words, at the time when he made this offer to David, it was like two kings meeting. That's how the Bible described it. But David said to him, how can I offer to my God something that costs me nothing? And so David insisted that he sold him the threshing floor, the bullock, and the wood at market value. Not because he didn't appreciate the gesture that the guy made, but because he understand that sacrifice meant sacrifice. Right. And so we see it here where he's saying, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. Here he's not saying, let us not, we shouldn't tell people we love them and we shouldn't be loving in our speech. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that if our love for others only stop at our mouth, at the things that we say and not the things that we do, we're frauds. You see that? Represent action word. Exactly. Love is an action, not a sentiment. Amen. Amen. Love is an action, not a figure of speech. So, he goes on and he says, what we should love in deed and in truth. So, in action and in purity. Now, I want us to get this. Not only must we do the right thing, but we must do the right thing for the right reason. Right. You know, there's a little limerick that says that the last temptation is the greatest treason, doing the right thing for the wrong reason. And so we have to be very careful of not only doing good, but doing good out of a good heart. Earlier, my wife went to the book of James So let's go back to the book of James and go to James chapter 2, verse 15 to 19, and we will see exactly what it is that John means here. Because remember, when we did the book of James, I told you that the book of James is practical Christianity, just as the book of Romans is pure theology. If you want to understand the theology behind the Bible, the book of Romans, if you want to understand how to be a Christian, the book of James. So let's go. James chapter 2, verses 15 through 19. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Amen, amen. So, what James is saying here is that we shouldn't just talk the talk. Mark it a blessing that was bestowed on this man who was in need. It was a mighty blessing, wasn't it? Mm. If you remember when Jacob tricked his father and got the blessing, and Esau came in and said, Bless me too, father. He says, I can't, because I have sustained him with food and shelter and clothes. I have already given everything to him. What does he mean? He means that the blessing has power to produce whatever you're blessing them with. Okay? So when we look at this, and we see it, it's a nice blessing. It's a really, really good blessing. Say, oh, depart in peace and be ye warmed and filled. But guess what's wrong with this? If you were concerned about him being warmed and filled, give him a coat. You would have given him a coat and fed him. 
right? What you did here was absolutely nothing except make yourself look magnanimous. And we can see this sentiment being echoed by Paul in Romans chapter 12 verse 9 which says, Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. When he says here, let love be without dissimulation, what is dissimulation? It's pretense. And that is why John say that when we love, we should love in deed, in action, and in truth. In truth is without dissimulation, without pretense, without any ulterior motives. When we do good, we should do good from a pure heart. We should not do good in order to promote ourselves. We should do good because doing good is the right thing to do. Right. You alluded to this text before, Galatians 6 and verse 2, where it says to bear one another's burdens and in doing so fulfill the law of Christ. Amen. Amen. And with that, let's go on to our next verse, 1 John chapter 3, verse 19, which reads, And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. Verse 20, And if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. Let's stop there for a moment, and let me explain what God is saying here. Nowadays, in our modern world, where do we get our sense of self-worth? We get it from our jobs. We get it from our possessions. We get it from the social circles that we move in. We get it in things externally. Back in the old days, do you know where they got their self-worth from? In family. They got it from their family. They got it from mommy and daddy, particularly daddy. Once your father was pleased with you, you didn't care what anybody else thought. Right, growing up, they used to tell us, especially when you're going out, you know, in public, they said, remember where you come from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Remember who you are. <laughs> and so what John is saying here is that we know that we are of the truth because we are getting our self-worth not from the external world, not from our family, but we're getting our self-worth from God. From That's him. all he's saying here. He's yeah. saying, so he says, if our heart condemn us, because that's how Satan is going to try to trick us. Oh, you're not good enough for God. You're a bad son. You're a lousy Christian. And he said, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and know it all things. So God knows, what is the thing that God knows here? He knows that you are his son and in you he is well pleased. Verse 21 says, and catch this, Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. So one of them is saying that, hey, listen, when your heart condemns you and you want to shirk away from God, remember, first of all, God knows everything. And secondly, God is greater than our feelings. So we can always go back to God. And when we are confident to God, then we'll tend to draw nigh to God, to draw near to God. So either way, no matter what is going on in our little head, we are always pressing closer to God. Whether we feel that we are good or whether we feel that we are bad, we're always pressing to God because that's where we get our sense of worth. And that's where our salvation is. Amen. Amen. On verse 22, which is in the same context which we just spoke about, says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his eyes. So let me explain <laughs> what's happening here. When you are God's, when you are living as a child of God, and every breath you take is in praise and glory to God, anything you ask of God, the Bible says he will give it to you. Why? Because when you're living like this, you won't ask and you won't seek after things that are not pleasing to God. It's as simple as that. So a lot of people see this and they say, for example, when Jesus made that promise in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, and he said, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will do it. And we're going to go to that verse. People think that the whatever includes 
sinful, selfish stuff. It doesn't include any of those things. All that that includes are things in the kingdom. Again, we are dealing with the dominions. God is saying, in my kingdom, anything you ask, I give it to you. Right, and he's talking to the people who are in his kingdom who wouldn't request those other stuff anyway. Right, and if you do request something that's in the other kingdom, God will tell you, oh, we have no fair trade deal with them. We, we don't import and export to them, so I can't provide that to you because I don't have it. It's not in my kingdom. Right? As James says, we have not because we Absolutely. ask not, and, and when, when we, we do ask, ask... We ask amidst to consume it in our lust. Amen, amen. And that, that's all that, that John is saying here in verse 22. So, to get a little more insight into this, let's spend a little more time, and I'm going to go through a few passages in the book of John where Jesus dealt with this issue. And so the first place we want to go is John chapter 14, verse 12 to 14. And we're going to see the unlimited, boundless promises that Jesus has left us with. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, if you notice in this passage, Jesus is saying, whatsoever you ask in my name, I'll do it. Right? I want you to bear that in mind. If you ask me, I'll do it. But I just want to touch on one thing before we leave this passage, and it's verse 12, where it's a very, very, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than thee shall he do. Folks, if you are a true Christian, that's exactly what you're asking for. You're asking for more of the ability to do the work that Jesus Christ has left us on this earth to do. That's your number one motivation. I'm just thinking when he said, in my name, because he mentioned that as a qualification, whatsoever you ask, in my name. If you should ask anything in my name. And the in my name would seem to qualify it to be something that's characteristic of what Jesus would do or say or ask of the Father. Which what he says when he was on earth that he only does what the Father shows him and he only says what the Father tells him. The in my name would seem to qualify the requests right, that are being made. Right. Amen. 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 It's just like when you mentioned earlier that, you know, when we were little and we're going out in public, they would always say, remember who you are. You know, don't go out there and misrepresent the family. In other words, don't go out there and do anything that's going to bring a bad name, a bad reputation on the family's name. Keep your family name pure by your actions. And it's exactly that. When you ask in Jesus' name, you would never ask for something that would sully or discredit Jesus' name. So, for example, TV evangelists, they don't do anything in Jesus' name because when they ask things in Jesus' name, they're asking things that Jesus would never, in a million, billion years, ever request of his people. Okay, so let's go to the next chapter, John chapter 15, and we'll read 15 to 17, and it's basically going to say the same thing. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Hold on. Here's what Jesus is saying. When you were servants, whatever the Father was doing, or whatever your Master was doing, was none of your business. You did as you were told. You didn't need to know why. You just did as you were told. Jesus is saying here that, hey, listen guys. From this point on, you're no longer servants. You're no longer in the dark. You are now friends, and my friends know my business. My friends know why I do what I'm doing, and they know when I ask them to do something, how it fits into the greater plan. You see that? He's saying that now you are in partnership with me and my father. We're building the kingdom together. 
Okay, continue. Verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. Amen. Now you see now, this second instruction that he gave them about asking and receiving, he says whatsoever you ask the Father, whatsoever you ask God, in Jesus' name, God will do it. God will give it to you. Okay? But there is one thing that I want to point out. In this, in verse 17, should not be ignored. Verse 17 is an intricate portion of asking in Jesus' name. You can only ask in Jesus' name if you love one another. Because as we said last week, as we established last week, and as John emphasized in the entire book of 1 John, loving your brethren is the number one criteria of a Christian. Okay? All right. Let's go one more chapter to John chapter 16, and this time we'll read from verses 23 to 27. So John chapter 16, verses 23 to 27. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, while the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. Isn't this wonderful? Jesus said, listen guys, when you pray in my name and you ask for something, I'm not going to ask the Father. I'm not going to pray the Father. Never. I'm not going to petition the Father. He said, I don't have to. Why? Because the Father hears you. loves you. Not just hears you. He loves you. And why does he love you? Because you love Jesus. Because you love Jesus. And you have believed me that I came from God. You see that? <laughs> Imagine Jesus says, listen, I'm making you a promise here. Whatever you ask, he doesn't put any limits on it. He says, whatever you ask, the Father will give it to you. And listen, folks, I'm not saying that when you ask for something, I'm going to go petition the Father on your behalf. He said, I'm not going to do that. He doesn't need to intercede in, in that. <laughs> exactly. The Father is more willing to give you of the kingdom than you're willing to ask. Mm -hmm. He said the father is eager because the father wants to show his appreciation for you believing and loving me. After all, Jesus is just God's agent. So. Amen. Amen. Now, I just want to go back to verse 25. And it says, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I will show you plainly of the Father. If you remember, when you go through the Gospels, you'll always see Jesus speaking parables, right? And he was speaking parables because of the unbelief of the people. And by the way, folks, the reason why he spoke parable wasn't so that they would understand. He spoke parables so that they would not understand. Because if they understood, then they would believe and they'll be saved and then they'll black side and they'll slide right back into a hotter part of hell than they would have before because their hearts were hard. hard. But every time he would teach these parables and he would, oh by the way, the, the way the parable work is that you and I are sitting side by side listening to Jesus tell these stories. I look at it and I say, oh nice story and I go my way. You sit there and you think about it and you start asking your question, what is it that he was really trying to tell us? And the more you think about it, the more the Holy Spirit comes in and explains it to you. And so you are saved because you want to be saved. Because you are seeking the things of God. That's how parables really work. But anyway, after he taught these parables, he would go back home 
or go back to wherever they're staying and the disciples would always come to him and say, Master. What did you mean? Exactly. You see, folks? And then he would have to explain to them because they too did not understand what he was teaching. But he says here and he promises here, from this point onwards, guess what, folks? No more parables. I am going to teach you plainly, teach you straight. And by the way, just so you know, when Jesus started his ministry, that's how he used to teach. He used to be very straight, very direct, very open, very plain. But the more their hearts grew cold and hard, then he decided, hey, I will speak only in parables because you can't handle the truth. That's that diligently searching attitude he wants to bring out. Amen, amen. And if you notice in these three passages that we just went through, Jesus is giving us a guarantee, isn't he? He says, whatsoever. A blank check. A blank check. Whatsoever. My question to you is, why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us and because we are here working for the kingdom. We are here working to fulfill the Great Commission. And to do that, what do we need? We need resources. We need capital. We need stuff. And so if we look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 50, this is what it says. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. He's saying that you are now a part of the family. And when you are a part of the family, you are daddy's responsibility. You see, this is a two-way street. Your responsibility to God is to do what daddy said. God's responsibility to you is to ensure that you have the resources to do what daddy said. It's as simple as that, folks. Don't complicate it. All right. So let's stay in the book of John and go to John chapter 8, verses 28 to 29. And the question is, why does Jesus give us this guarantee? Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Amen. So you see, folks, Jesus was always doing the things that please God. And in fact, in John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So my sustenance, the most important thing in my life, is to do the will of God. And when that is true in your life, remember he said you were servants, you weren't required to do this. But now that you're friends, now that you're family, you also are required to do these. The thing that make you uniquely God is that you always do the things that please God. And when you're doing that, that is when the guarantee kicks in. That is when whatsoever you ask, God will do it. That is when you can ask for the storm to be calm, for resources to be supplied, for healing to be administered. When you are in the will of God, when the only thing that you're interested in is to see the name of Jesus Christ magnified and God glorified. And the meat in that verse you just read, meat is food, right? That provides you with strength and maintenance for your body. And he's saying that to do the will of God is what strengthens him and propels him to continue on. Right. And as Job said, Job put it like this. Job says, I've seen thy word more than my necessary food. And that is why God could look at Satan and say, have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like him in the earth. Because he was living to please God in every way that he could. Right. And that is what now becomes important to him. Not so much the food that keeps him alive, but the God that gives him life. So folks, if you have not figured out why God will give us whatsoever we ask, this guarantee, the reason is very simple. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, just as how 
Jesus did. And when we do this, when we are always doing what is pleasing in God's sight, this eliminates all selfish or sinful requests. And he can trust you with the things that you're asking for. Exactly, because when we are all in for God, then God is all in for us. Okay, folks? So we are becoming Christ. We are becoming just like Jesus. If you remember, we went over it where it tells us that God's plan for us is that we should be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And I guess this is a good place to remind us that the Bible is not little compartments, little pigeonholes. The Bible is just one book. It's one thought. It's all connected. It's all intertwined. Okay? So wherever you end in the Bible, you will meet everything else in the Bible. I don't know if you understand that, but it makes sense to me. Let's continue. First John chapter 3 verse 23 and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son jesus christ and love one another as he gave us commandment now folks before we go on i just want to point out something in the entirety of today's scripture reading if you notice it talks about that god gave us a commandment but it also said that we should keep his commandments okay so let me explain what the commandment and the commandments are when it talks about the commandment that god gave us a commandment singular it's either talking about believing on the name of jesus christ or loving each other that's it but when it talks about that we keep his commandments then that includes the aforementioned two And it includes the Ten Commandments and all the laws of Moses. Okay? And folks, for those of you who believe that the commandments were done away with, and folks, when we talk about the commandments, we're not talking, the Bible is never talking about just the Ten. It's talking about every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. If you think that these things were done away with, it just got resurrected. Because John is saying that, This is how you know that you belong to God. If we keep his commandments. These two words, commandment and commandments. They're not the same thing. One is very specific to believing in Jesus Christ and loving your brother as yourself. The other is all of God's commandments together. All right. So it says again in verse 23, 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. And this is his commandment. Whose commandment? God's. God's. That's the second thing I want to point out. In this passage of reading, everywhere you see it refers to his, it is speaking about God. It's specifically speaking about God. And so it says, and this is his commandment, God's commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, And love one another as he gave us commandment. That's the commandment. Believe on Jesus Christ. Love one another. And where did God tell us to believe on Jesus Christ? So I'm going to show you several places where God told us to believe on Jesus Christ. And the first one is Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 through 5. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Hold on. Let me explain what's happening here, because I've never really heard anyone explain it before. So let me explain it just in case you ever wondered what happened with Jesus here. If you remember when Moses got the Ten Commandments, he was up in the mountain with God for forty days and forty nights. And when he came down, what happened? His face shone. His face shone because he was in the glory of God. When Jesus was in the presence of God, not for 40 days and 40 nights, but probably for 40 minutes, guess what? He lit up like a light bulb. And the reason why he shone so brightly was because he was so much purer than Moses. You see, Moses' sinful flesh 
shun after it had been in the presence of God for a while. It lit up with the glory of God. Jesus, because he is so pure, as soon as he gets into the presence of God, woo, he just lit up like a bulb. Okay, folks? All right. Now, continue verse 3. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. You see, this is where God told us to listen to him, to, listen to, him, to believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Listen to him. Believe him. What when he said, hear he him, listen to him. Folks, if you know the Bible, this will immediately take you to where God first told us that Jesus was coming and we should listen to him. And that can be found in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15. And this is Moses speaking. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. See, Moses says that there is coming a prophet, which is one of you, which is one of your brethren, which is blood related to you, is going to be like me, and unto him shall ye hearken. Him you're going to listen to. You're going to believe him. Now, folks, when Moses said that there was a prophet coming after him, one of your brethren, Moses was not talking about the slew of prophets that would follow right throughout the Old Testament. It's a capital P prophet. He was... <laughs> well, Moses didn't speak in capital P, so... <laughs> but I know what my wife is saying. You know, it's like... He's a definite prophet, specific person. Right. He's speaking about one particular prophet. And up until the day that Jesus was born, that prophet had not appeared. And how do I know this? Maurice, you're always making up these stuff. How do I know this, folks? Again, we go to the Bible because the Bible is our only source of truth. So let's go to the Bible and go to John chapter 1, verses 19 to 25. And this is the record of John. And this is John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. Go on. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. You notice what they asked him? Art thou that prophet? That is a prophet that they have been looking for for hundreds of years. The prophet that Moses promised would come. Go on. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as saith the prophet Elias. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, Neither that prophet. Amen. Amen. You see? So they were still looking and hoping for this prophet that was promised by Moses. Moses. And that is where God at first told us that he's sending someone. And when he sent him, that we should hear him. We should listen to him. Why? Because who he was sending was his son, Jesus Christ, who would come as prophet, priest, and king. All right, let's continue staying in the book of John again. We are spending a lot of time in the book of John today. John chapter 6, verses 14 to 15. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Amen, amen. So you see, they are watching Jesus and they say, no, 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 no. 
this guy fits the bill for that profit. And so let us go and now see somewhere where someone explicitly tells us that Jesus Christ is that prophet. And for that, let's go to the first sermon ever spoken in the Christian church. And that is in Acts chapter 3, verses 22 to 26. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. So that's how we know that these prophets were not that prophet because they all told us that that prophet was coming. Go on. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And there Peter confirms to us that Jesus Christ is that prophet. And of that prophet, God says what? Hear he him, obey him, do what he says, because he is the only means for you to have life. You see that? Yes. He said that earlier in verse 23, where it says, And it shall come to pass that every soul which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. When it says here that shall be destroyed from among the people, if you remember in John chapter 3, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him might have everlasting life. But later down he says that those who do not believe are condemned already. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but those who do not believe are condemned already. So folks, he did not come to condemn us, he came to save us. We were condemned already, as I've been teaching you, in Adam. We were condemned in Adam. Okay, folks? Okay, let's move on. The next verse in our study for today, 1 John chapter 3, verse 24 reads, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he has given us. So folks, let me make this simple for us and I'm going to change out the he's here that refers to God so that we can understand it easier. And it says, And he that keepeth God's commandment dwelleth in God and God in him. Hereby we know that God abideth in us by the spirit which God has given us. Okay? So that's the sign that we are Christian. That is the down payment. That is a sure sign that we are Christians. Not because we worship on a certain day. Or because we speak in tongues. Or any of those external things. The thing that assures our heart that we are saved, that we are God's children, is that we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And I think we're going to come back to that again. So let's go to John chapter 15. Oh, we are in the book of John again. Let's go to John chapter 15, verse 26. And we will see exactly what John means here. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he will testify of me. Amen. So the Spirit of God, his job is to testify of Jesus. His job is to assure you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You see, folks? And once you have that assurance in your heart, then it means that you are of God because you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. And as I, exp I think I mentioned this in our last study, that the Bible tells us that God dwelleth in us and that Jesus dwelleth in us, but Whenever the Bible describes those things, it's not that God dwelleth in us or that Jesus dwelleth in us. It's that the Holy Spirit dwelleth in us. And that Spirit is sometimes referred to as the Spirit of 
God, and sometimes it's referred to as the spirit of truth. of Jesus, or as my wife says, the spirit of truth. Okay? Let me just spend a few minutes explaining what it means to have the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I want to do this is because for most of my Christian life, what I was told and what everybody that I know was told was that if you got baptized, you have the Holy Spirit. Folks, that's a lie. It's unbiblical. It's not true. As I began to mature in God and as God began to reveal the truth of the Bible to me, one of the things that I discovered was that the reason why the pastors always said whenever you question them as to whether or not you have the Holy Spirit, that you got the Holy Spirit when you got baptized, is that the pastors themselves did not have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it sounds harsh, but it is true. Folks, you only get the Holy Spirit when you're born again from above. Now, let me explain once again what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. If you remember, there are a couple of stories that I'm quickly going to go through. The first one is Cornelius. If you remember, Peter went down to the Cornelius house. He preached to Cornelius and in the middle of his sermon, the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and Cornelius and his household began to speak in tongues. And so Peter looks around, he looks at the rest of the disciples and he says to them, can any man forbid that we baptize these guys who have received the same spirit that we did? And so they baptized Cornelius and his household and they are now born again because they have been born of the water and the spirit. And folks, let me explain what happened with Peter and Cornelius. The reason why Cornelius and his household received the baptism of the Spirit before the baptism of water is because if God did not first baptize Cornelius and his household, Peter and the other disciples, because of their prejudice, would never have baptized them. God had to demonstrate to them that, hey, the things that I have clean, don't you call unclean. Okay? So, that's the first case where we see someone receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit before we receive the baptism of water. The second story I want to tell you is when Philip went down and he preached and a lot of people in the city believed him. But guess what, folks? Although he baptized them, none of them received the Holy Spirit. And so what they did is they sent up to Jerusalem and Peter came down. And Peter started to baptize them with the Holy Spirit. In other words, he started to lay hands on them and they would receive the Holy Spirit. They would speak in tongues. They would show manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. And there was one guy there who was a sorcerer, Simon the Sorcerer, the warlock. And Simon, when he saw that Peter could lay hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit, he came to Peter and he offered Peter money to give him this Holy Spirit, to give him this power. And Peter looks him in the eye and Peter says, your money perishes with you. And when Peter said that to him, man, that scared the living daylight out of him. And he begged Peter, oh, please pray for me that God will forgive me this trespass. Folks, the third story I want to tell you is when Paul met 12 disciples on the road. And when he questioned them if they had received the Holy Spirit. Mark, you meet some disciples on the road and the first thing you can think of is asking them if you received the Holy Spirit. That's, that's like an insult. But they looked at Paul and they said, we have not even heard that there be an Holy Spirit. And so Paul says, of what then were you baptized? And they said, of John's baptism, John the Baptist. And then Paul says, oh. And so he explained to them the relationship between John and and Jesus and when they heard about Jesus then they were baptized not rebaptized they were baptized for the first time in Jesus Christ and then they received of the baptism of the spirit so folks a lot of us has been going to church for years for decades and we have not been born again because we have not received the baptism 
of the Spirit. Yes, we have been baptized in the water, but as I demonstrate, baptizing in the water does not mean that you are born again. Baptism is a two-part process. The first part, which is incumbent on me, is for me to be baptized in the water. The second part is the prerogative of God. And if God accepts me, then he gives me, he baptizes me with the Holy Spirit. I have to have both baptisms in order for me to be born again, except in the case where I cannot be baptized of the water. For example, the thief on the cross, he could not be baptized, but I guarantee you that he did receive the baptism of the Spirit, because without the baptism of the Spirit, you will not see God. So, if you have not, or if you're unsure that you are baptized of the Spirit, that you have the Holy Spirit living in you. Folks, this is not something to get all hoity-toity and to get all offended because somebody tell you that you might not have the Holy Spirit. This is something that you should check out because the Bible tells us that we should examine ourselves to see if we be in the faith. The first step of doing that examination is finding out, do I have the Spirit of God living in my heart? And folks, the easiest way to know that is that if you have been living in sin and you have been comfortable with it, you do not have the Holy Spirit. And if you do not have the Holy Spirit, folks, then the only way for you to receive it is not from another man. You have to go to the source. You have to go down on your knees and you stay on your knees and you pray to God Almighty and you stay there until he gives you of the Holy Spirit. Because, folks, catch this. God has assured us that he's more willing to give us of this Holy Spirit than your father or your mother was willing to give you food to eat. Okay? So, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, go down on your knees and you stay there until God gives it to you. And you keep seeking and you keep searching and you keep going after the Holy Spirit. Forget everything else. Forget the offices in church. Forget your pride and your pomp and your circumstances. If you need to stay home from church for a few weeks, you stay home and you pray and you pray and you pray until God find it fit to impart his most precious gift of the Holy Spirit to you. And then, and only then, are you saved. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Until we meet again, walk with the Spirit and be a blessing. Goodbye.